I'm going to talk today about um, the structure of the guard cell wall and how this implements the stomata function, and with a particular focus on a certain cell wall component called arabnan. So this slide should look pretty familiar. Um, we've just seen a very similar slide from Alistair. Um, so stomata regulate plant gas exchange, and they are pores which are found upon the surface of the leaf, which swell and deflate in response to multiple different stimuli, well listed up here, um, which opens and closes the stomata pore. So when the stomata are open, this allows gases to diffuse into the plant, which are required for processes such as photosynthesis. And when the stomata, um, yet as a consequence of this, water also can move out of the stomata pore via rapid transpiration. And excessive transpiration can be detrimental to plant growth and to yields. During stomatal opening and closure, there are massive changes in the cell volume. So when we go from the closed state to the open state, there can be an up to 25% increase in cell volume. So this is pretty huge, and this is putting an enormous amount of pressure upon the, guard, on the cell wall. Um, so the, the guard cells experience about 10 times greater pressure than, any, than most of the plant cell types. And if other cells were to, un, were to experience these types of pressures, they would just simply burst because the cell wall is not designed to withstand high pressure. Whereas, so, whereas the guard cell is able to undergo reversible changes multiple times a day and it can return back to its original shape, indicating that there must be something pretty unique about the guard cell wall that allows them to do this. And in our lab, we're interested in finding out what's in the guard cell wall that makes them unique and whether we can manipulate the structure of the guard cell wall um, to alter how the stomata are moving, how they are opening and closing, which may allow us to reduce water loss from the plant. So the plant cell wall is made of three major components. We've got cellulose microfibrils, which are these big tubes, and they're the major structural component. These are often found in association with hemicelluloses, and these also have structural properties. And then all of this is embedded within a pectin matrix. And pectin's known to have roles in cell wall flexibility and cell wall hydration. Um, so we think this is a good candidate for looking at guard cells, as we know the guard cells wall must, needs to be flexible yet strong to allow it to do this shape change. So pectin comes in multiple different forms. Uh, there are five different forms found within the plant cell wall. And previous work in our lab have looked at, has looked at this form, the HG, and found that altering the substitutions on this form of pectin alters stomatal function. I know Paige, who's here, has looked at this form, the RG2. You should look at her poster later on. And that also has implications in stomatal movement. And we are now interested in moving on to RG1, or rhamnoglactronin 1. So this is just a simplified diagram of the previous one I, shown, I, sh I showed, uh, but with only the parts that I'm particularly interested in. So this is RG1, we've got a backbone structure, and then coming off it, we've got these side chains. And these are a cell wall component called arabinan. Um, so arabinan can come in multiple different forms. We've got short chains, long chains, and these chains can either be branched or linear. And there has been some previous work done looking at the role of arabinan in stomatal function. So um, in 2003, it, the Joan uh, McQueen Mason group showed that if you remove the arabinan side chains using enzymatic degradation, then this impairs stomatal function. And it's proposed that the arabinan side chains act as spaces between the pectin molecules, backbones. So here they are preventing the two pectin backbones from getting too close together. Whereas if we remove the arabinan using enzyme treatment, then this allows the two backbones to come together and calcium bonds can form between the backbone structures, which essentially locks them together and reduces the um, flexibility of the cell wall and therefore preventing the stomatal movement. So this was proposed yeah, back in 2003, and since then there's just been very little work done looking at arabinan, and particularly in guard cell walls. So we're quite interested to see if we can unpick the molecular basis behind, um, behind arabinan synthesis, and if we can alter the structure of the arabinan um, to alter stomatal movement, but not to such a great extent as completely locking them shut, as that'd be no use. <laughs> so in my project, I'm interested in um, whether we can find the ide well, identify the location of arabinan uh, within, the, within arabidopsis guard cells, 
We want to uh, find the genes regulating the synthesis of arabinan. And then we want to look at the role of arabinan in stomatal function, whole plant physiology. And finally, we're also interested to see whether there are conserved features of guard cell walls across eudicots and monocot species. So first of all, we just wanted to check where the arabinan was within the plant. And we can do this using a technique called immunolabeling, which uses ant specific antibodies. So we have one antibody that binds to short chains of arabinan and one that binds to the longer chains. And so we apply these antibodies to thin tissue sections and then we apply a secondary antibody. And this secondary antibody has an attached fluorescent tag. So if both of these antibodies bind, then we'll get green signal where that cell wall component is. And this is what we see when we put it on a Arabidopsis, so the model plant species. Uh, so with the antibody for short chains of Arabinan, we get very strong signal around the guard cell. And the signal is pretty guard cell localised. We don't see much signal elsewhere across the plant epidermis. Whereas with the longer chain of Arabinan, we simply see no signal, we just get a blank screen. <laughs> so I think this is quite interesting in that it seems that there is a specific form of the Arabinan which is more important in the guard cells uh, than the, yeah, so it appears short chains are more important than the longer chains. And we wanted to see if we could identify genes which were causing this pattern. So using online databases, we wanted to look for genes which are more highly expressed in the guard cells than in the surrounding mesophyll cells or the epidermal pavement cells. Uh, so we we're looking specifically for Arabinan synthesis genes. And we identified one gene uh, which has been previously characterised in other areas of the plant called Arabinan deficient 1 or ARAD1 for short. And this has, you can see, highly, more highly expressed in the guard cells than in the mesophyll. And so we've got tDNA knockout lines of this gene and we've also got uh, various other lines coming through the cloning process. So we've got complemented lines, overexpressors and reporter lines all coming through. Um, but when we look at the plants, this is the tDNA knockout line and it looks pretty indistinguishable from the control. Uh, they have no obvious phenotype when we just look at them in the growth chamber. So first of all, we just wanted to check that this, um, this line does actually have a reduction in arabinam. So we do this using a technique called an ELISA, which is very similar to the immunolabeling technique which I showed before. Um, but instead here we take a whole leaf, grind it up, and then we can extract the cell wall pop it into a 96 well plate and then we add a primary antibody, secondary antibody and finally a substrate. And this substrate changes colour depending how much the cell wall component is present. So here you see the darker yellow indicates there is more of that cell wall component. And then we put this into a plate reader and quantify the signal and you can see the red one has quite significantly less short chains of arabinan than the control. And then we can look closer with the guard cells themselves and we can see again that the guard cells do appear to have reduced signal in the ARAD1 mutant for the short chains of arabinan compared to the control. So it's positive, we seem to have a mutant line which is, has less arabinan in the guard cells. So next we wanted to look at the role of arabinan in stomatal function. So as Alistair has already talked about, and Darwin also, <laughs> um, the use of thermal imaging to look at to, as a proxy for stomatal movement. Um, because if the stomata are closed, leaf temperature increases, whereas if the stomata are open, water can move out of the plant and therefore leaf temperature decreases. So we've used a dynamic thermal imaging system to uh, look at the stomatal opening response. Um, so here we've got just the plants laid out and then we just cover them up, uh, put them into the dark to close the stomata. And then once we remove the box, we can start a thermal imaging camera and take pictures of the plants every minute. And then we can track the stomatal movement over time. So um, in green, we have the co control. And you see there's quite a rapid decrease in leaf temperature as the plants are exposed to light, as we would expect as the stomata are opening up. And after about 20 minutes, the stomata are sort of at their maximum aperture. They're quite happy. Whereas with the ARAD1 mutant, we see there is a, the stomata are very slow to respond. There's a, very, there's a big lag in the stomata opening response, and it takes about 40 minutes for them to uh, reach maximum aperture. Uh, so yeah, they're about twice as slow to respond as the control. So I think this is quite an interesting pattern that um, it looks as if removing arabinan is slowing down the stomata response. 
So we wanted to check this in other sys um, yeah, with other um, stimuli. So here we've used uh, fluctuating light. So in a field, a plant has to be able, the stimuli need to be able to respond quickly. Um, as the sun goes behind a cloud, they go into the shade. So the stimuli need to be, be able to open and close very rapidly. Uh, so here we used infrared gas analysis uh, to sort of try and stimul simulate a field environment, sort of. <laughs> um, so we had light fluctuating between 0 and 1500 micromoles every five minutes, and then took a stimulator conductance reading at the end of each five minute period. And with the control, you see we get an increase in stimulator conductance at the end of the light period and a decrease at the end of the dark period, which we would expect. Whereas you see the line is much flatter for the ARAD1. So this is indicating again that these stimata are just unable to respond to light. They can't open in response to high light and therefore they've got nowhere to close to. Um, so again, this was just confirming our thoughts that these stimata um, are pretty unresponsive. And next we wanted to check whether this was a light response or whether they are responding in similar ways to other stimuli. So we've also looked at the response to carbon dioxide. So we've done this using two different techniques, first of which is an epidermal strip bioassay. So here we are isolating the, the guard cells uh, by taking an epidermal peel from the surface of the leaf, and then we can pop this into a buffer solution and bubble different concentrations of carbon dioxide through the buffer. So we have a CO2 free air treatment which opens the stomata, and a high CO2 treatment which closes the stomata. And as you can see, the ARAD1, under low CO2, again, is unable to open its stomata as wide as the control. And it does also have a reduced aperture at ambient CO2. But quite interestingly, the stomata appear to be able to close normally. That doesn't seem to have been impaired by removing arabinam. And then we can confirm this using, um, again, using the infrared gas analysis system. Uh, and this looks at a whole plant response. So here the leaf is left attached to the plant. We're not removing anything from the plant. So here we set up a program where the leaves are subjected to um, ambient CO2 to stabilize them. Then we increase the CO2 right up to 1,000 ppm to induce stomata closure. And again, you can see the stomata of the ARAD1 are able to close normally. There doesn't seem to be any defects in closure. But when we drop the CO2 back down to 100 ppm to open up the stomata, you can see the ARAD1 in blue uh, is slower to respond again, and it also never quite reaches the same aperture as the control. So this combination of different experiments has sort of confirmed to us that this line does have an impairment in stomatal opening. It is both slower and also can't, never reaches quite the same aperture as the control. And so next we wanted to see if there are any implications to whole plant physiology and water use efficiency. Um, so we've just done some pilot studies on this part of the project so far. Um, first of all, we looked at, um, so we grew plants up in sort of normal conditions, so they're pretty happy, and then moved them into a very stressful environment where they had continuous light and also they were droughted. So they were pretty stressed out, but we really just wanted to push the system to its limits and see what we got to start with. And then we weighed the um, pots every day and to track how much water these plants were using. So as you can see in blue, again, the ARAD1 loses less water every day compared to the control. And we hypothesize that this is just because if the stomata aren't open as wide as the control, therefore less water can move out of the plant. So we, we've got lots more plans over the coming months to uh, look into this further. Uh, to look, in, look at different stimuli, um, different concentrations of, say, light, CO2. Uh, but as an initial look at this, we're quite excited, looks quite promising. And this just takes me on to the final part of my project. Um, so I'm just going to talk quite briefly about um, whether guard cell water structure is conserved across the Eudocot and Monocot species. So all of the work I've presented so far has been from this plant here, Arabidopsis, which is an example of a eudocot species. Whereas we've got this whole other group of plants uh, called the monocots, and in particular I'm interested in the grasses, the poaceae. So most of the agronomically important plants are in, this are in this group of plants, so everything like wheat, rice, maize, they're all 
yeah, monocot species. And they look very different. And also, if we look at their stomata, their stomata look very different. So the shape of the stomata varies between these species. Uh, eudocots have your textbook guard cells, um, whereas the monocots have dumbbell-shaped guard cells, and they also have two surrounding cells called subsidiary cells. Um, so these are an example. This is Brachypodium, which is a model monocot species, quite closely related to wheat. Um, and it's been well documented that the general cell wall structure of these two types of plants varies. So they both contain lots of cellulose, uh, but the amount and, well, the form and the abundance of the hemicellulose and pectin varies between them. But what's not really known is whether the guard cells of these two types of plants, whether they have conserved structures, whether they have this, a similar cell wall composition, or whether there is variation between them, so whether they stick more to the general pattern we see within their plant type. So if I just take you back to this uh, immunolabeling diagram I showed earlier, where we've got an, uh, one antibody binding to short chains of Rabinan and one binding to longer chains. And when we look at the uh, a comparison between eudocots and monocots, so between Arabidopsis and Brachypodium, we see some similarities and some differences. So take back to so Arabidopsis, we see this strong signal in the guard cells with short chains and no signal with longer chains. Whereas when we look at Brachypodium, this monocot species, Again, we get very strong signal in the guard cells and we, with the short chains, and we also get signal in the surrounding subsidiary cells. Um, so this is yeah, quite a similar pattern looking to the Arabidopsis. Uh, but then when we look at the longer chains, we see there is signal in the guard cells with the longer chains, but nowhere else. So this is quite an interesting pattern. It appears that there are differences in perhaps the importance of different forms of Arabinan within, between the monocots and the eudicots. And we've been trying to develop some Brachypodium mutant lines to further look into these patterns, but they're still an ongoing project. So we can't really look any further at this at the minute, but hopefully in the future we will. So just in summary, um, we found that the genetic modification of the Arabidopsis Arad1 gene impairs stomatal opening, yet stomatal closure is unaffected. Um, Arabidopsis plants deficient in Arad1 perform better under drought conditions when other environmental conditions are stressful. And both Arabidopsis and Brachypodium guard cells are enriched in short chains of Arabinan, uh, yet the distribution of longer chains of Arabinan seems to vary between these plant types. So with that, I'd just like to thank uh, my supervisors, Andrew Fleming and Julie Gray, uh, all these people in the lab for their help with various different techniques and parts of this project. And just thank Paul Knox from Leeds University who supplied all of the antibodies that we use. And thank you for listening.